All right, well, um, we might just um, thanks, thanks everyone for coming today. Um, this is a series series of four presentations. Uh, three of us are off to um, ASFB conference uh, next next week, so this is an opportunity. Just two opportunities. One is to um, to present to a local Darwin audience uh, who who won't make it to um, Hobart. ASFB, and second is to um, to have a bit of a dry run and um, get some feedback from a hopefully friendly crowd. Um, so I'm off the um, first cap off the rank today. Um, welcome to my presentation: catch composition of a traditional Indonesian shark fishery operating off northwestern Australia. Now it's pretty fundamental that good good fisheries management relies on good information, and probably the most basic piece of information fisheries managers need is to know what species are being caught in the catch. It's pretty basic, pretty simple information, right? And it should be pretty easy to determine. Well, it's not always the case. And today's seminar is about how uh, me and my co-authors uh, went about uh, determining the catch composition of a, um, of, a, of a traditional Indonesian fishery legally operating within Australian waters in an area of northwestern Australia called the MAU Box. Now, over the years, over the last decade or so, there's been increasing concern about, about a number of shark fisheries. There's been documented declines, and there's, um, there's an increasing growing groundswell of uh, sustainability concerns. This has resulted in a number of species being listed, uh, listed on international conservation conventions such as CITES. So, it's very, so shark fisheries need a high level of information, including knowing what species are caught. In the MAU box shark fishery, very little is known, known about species composition and size of the catch. What work, well, not a lot of work has been conducted out there, but there has been one study out there. And in 2006, Mark Meekin and co, uh, using brubs, went out and surveyed um, fished reefs in the MAU box and unfished reefs. And what they found was the diversity of sharks on, on fished reefs uh, was lower and the number of sharks was lower on fish reefs than those that were unfished. So this is a little bit of concerning news concerning the fishery operating out there. What sort of impact is it having? Having. Um, now, determining catch composition in the MOU box offers, offers some significant challenges. One, it's a long, long way away from anywhere. Two, um, so the skipper, the, all the catches landed into a um, into a foreign port, and the skippers and crew don't speak English, which is a significant barrier as well. It's also um, with tropical shark fisheries. It's, it's also hard enough to tell a species of shark when you have the actual animal in front of you, let alone if you're forced to um, try and make a species ID based on body parts. Fortunately for us, um, there's been a bit of work gone into looking at. Um, how determining species comp species of shark from their fins, and in, in the recent uh, in recent years, there's been two PhD uh, students who have dedicated their their study to this, this exact purpose. One was by Lindsay Marshall, who used morphometric techniques to to um, identify sharks from the fins, and the other was by Jenny Giles, who who uh, used genetic techniques to determine to trace shark fins origin origin. And, and the, these two studies that provide the basis of the method that we took out in the field and tested in the MAU box. So with that in mind, our project aims for this project were to go out into the MAU box and determine what species of shark are being caught by the fishery. And secondly, this, this opportunity um, presented us with an opportunity to test two semi-automated fin identification methods. Um, one was recently released by the FAO, where all it takes is a photo of the fin to be uploaded into the program, and it'll provide you with an estimate of the species. And the second was the, um, the morphometric techniques developed by um, Lindsay Marshall. So a little bit about the MAU box. The MAU box is, is um, way out here off the northwestern coast um, of Australia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Northwestern coast of Australia. Now, traditional Indonesian fishers have been have been visiting northern Australia for, for centuries, for centuries. And um, when Australia declared its EEZ, they they were prevented from legally continuing this activity. However, in a, in a sign of um, of cooperation between the two countries and Australia recognising that 
that there's been a long-standing use of Australian or Northern Australian resources by Indonesians. They negotiated access to some areas of, of Northern Australia where, where Indonesian is just going to legally come and and collect our, or collect Australian resources in Australian waters. And today, today this is um, restricted to this 42,000 kilometre area, but otherwise known as DMOU box. Now, traditionally, um, Indonesian fishermen, fishermen entering Australian waters have, have collected sedimentary uh, organisms such as sea cucumbers and trochus shell. But increasingly, over the last decade, there's been an increasing trend to uh, target target shark species, and this is probably mostly driven by the higher value of higher value of fins. So just to um, just to put it in perspective, just how far away this is from Australian perspective, um, it's, it's 700, 766 kilometres from Darwin, it's so over 400 kilometres from Broome, but from right here in Indonesia, it's only 100 odd kilometres. So this is far, this area is far more accessible to Indonesia than it is to Australia. Now, one of the um, one of the stipulations about these these fishes coming into Australia or coming into the IOU box to harvest resources is that they must be a a type type two vessel. That is that that no motors are permitted or no hydraulics. So and this is a typical shark vessel operating in the area. This is a um, this is a, a another shark vessel at anchor. Um, from from here, you can note that the uh, this is this is the accommodation crew and this little here. Um, the crew spend, spend, spend a lot of time sitting up on here where it's obviously much cooler. Um, this is us uh, boarding, boarding one of the vessels. Um, you can see the pretty, pretty basic sort of design, not a lot of freeboard. Uh, cooking is, is hot in a gas room out on the back deck and there's um, anything, or most, most of all the boats that we, we surveyed there was between five and seven crew. Now these guys are pretty Pretty hardcore in it, that most trips are a month or longer in, in duration. So they spend a lot of time on these little boats. Now this is uh, a photo of us doing our thing inside the cabin. It's not so much, um, I didn't put it on here just to show us actually working, but um, it's actually uh, more so just to show the nature of the accommodation inside these little boats. So yeah, seven, up to seven guys sleeping, sleeping in there and um, Dry areas are pretty restricted to some compartments under the floor where rice and water is kept. Um, and of course, you know, the most valuable part of the catch is the fins, the dry fins are stored under, underneath the floor. Uh, electronics are very limited. Um, on some boats, they had handheld GPSs. Uh, on one particular boat, this GPS didn't work until um, the skipper decided, he said, oh, hang on a second, and he, he twigged a wire, twisted a battery, and he said, oh, there you go, that's how I, that's how I find all my way from Rotate right down to here to Browse Island. Which is, so these, these guys are, are very skilled sailors, very skilled fishermen, and operate in some pretty harsh conditions. Uh, the fishing gear that they use to target sharks is uh, long lines, pretty basic long lines. Um, the traces are a twisted stainless wire. Um, the backbone is... Uh, is this rope and the weights, as you can see, are anything that can get, basically, just take it to the bottom. Bait is anything they can get hold of, other meat from other sharks, um, reef fish, um, and just, just generally anything that's available. The obvious question is, with no motors and no hydraulics, how do you get these great big sharks on board? We asked this question to one of the skippers and he, he dug around underneath the, um, underneath the compartment and pulled out these hand gaps. So it's all manual labour. To, to bring these, to, to haul the line, to bring to bring the sharks on board and, and to process them. These guys uh, retain, they dry the flesh and take that back to Rotair. They also retain um, shark skins and, and cartilage and, and they also keep the jaws of large tiger sharks. But obviously the most valuable uh, part of the catch is the shark skin. And this is uh, dried on deck before it's, um, it's packed and stored away mm -hmm. to return back, back to Indonesia. So in May last year, I, uh, I went out with uh, Will Hansen from um, AFMA and we, we went out on, on the Australian Border Force IAC and they took us out to the MOU box. We were out there for three weeks and during that three weeks we sampled, oh, we were able to, to board um, ten, nine different vessels. Um, nine different vessels. Once we were on board the vessel, uh, we, asked, we introduced ourselves and asked the skipper uh, if we could sort through their, 
their fins. Um, all of them were more than happy to oblige. Uh, we sort through their, their fins and take the dorsal fins out. We photograph each dorsal fin and then take a genetic sample from each dorsal fin. Um, we also interviewed the skipper and found out basic information such as how long they were at sea, what that long blind gear was, how do they, you know, and, and find out about their operation. Um, so once we'd been out and collected any information, uh, we brought, brought the photos back and we used four different methods to identify the fins. So we used the FAO Eye Shark Fin Program, which is freely downloadable and it's been promoted by FAO as a, a one-stop shop to, for people in the field to be able to identify, identify the species of shark just from a photo of its fin. So we used the morphometric technique developed by Lindsay Marshall, uh, which is taking a series of measurements on the fin. Um, you enter this into a series of equations and it will provide you with an idea of the shark. We also used Lindsay's uh, dedicated a fair bit of her life to um, identifying sharks from their fins. So she also used her expert eye, I guess is the best way to determine, uh, to see what she thought the species was. And we measured the success of these other three methods against getting the species genetically, uh, genetically identified. And what we came up with was a list of 16 different species from 153 sharks that were that we sampled on on these on these um, on these nine vessels. What you quickly get to see when you look down this list of species is that is that they're all large sharks, large, larger bodied sharks with um, the typically more susceptible to uh, fishing pressure like history traits. The two most um, common species in the catch are sandbar sharks and tiger sharks. Both of these are um, quite quite interesting, in particular sandbar sharks, as um, the Western Australian shark fisheries have undergone a number of um, uh, have been severely reduced and we're concerned sandbar shark being overfished in Western Australia. Tiger shark is another big, uh, large, iconic shark, I guess. Um, and it was interesting that the number of boats in the in the fleet seem to be specialist tiger shark catchers. Um, other species of note in this in this list of species that were able to put together are the silky shark and the scalloped hammerhead shark and the grey hammerhead shark. Now all these have been listed on international conventions recently, um, and it's likely that they'll be listed on the EPVC Act in the near future, and as such, are protected species. So these are present in the catch as well. Now we're able to take just from from the um, from the fins, we're able to glean, glean a little bit more information. Um, there's uh, there's well established uh, dorsal fin size to total fin total length of size um, for sharks. So we're able to, to put together a size composition of the catch. Uh, again, what you what you see is a lot of these animals are big, so the fishery is operating with big large sharks, and um, most most of these species, the size of which they're called, are in the sub-adult to adult range. The weight the total weight of the um, of the of the catch that we sampled was over ten and a half tons. So what this means for the MOU box in terms of management is that um, our, our, our initial little uh, pilot study out there demonstrated that there is a substantial fishery operating in, in the MOU box. It's targeting, targeting large, large species of shark, large vulnerable species of shark. This fishery isn't regulated in the same sense as Australian fisheries are. Uh, and, and obviously with, this, with these factors in, cut in, in place, there needs to be improved improved information about exactly what, what is being caught, what is being caught and how much of that is being caught and landed. Um, the, other, the other surprising thing, particularly with sandbar sharks, is, is that the MOU box catches need to be incorporated in the current harvest, harvest models to uh, determine whether, whether these catches are sustainable and the fishery is still transitioning from being overfished into a, in, still, still transitioning from being overfished. Now the other, the other part of the project was uh, measuring the success or otherwise of the, um, the semi-automatic shark, shark, shark ID, shark fin ID methods. The FAO shark eye fin program um, had a quite a disappointing success rate of around 30%. Uh, Lindsay Marshall's morphometric ID technique was uh, quite a bit better.
about 70 percent while the expert visual ID that is Lindsay's eye looking at the pins and determining what species was pretty reasonable at 100 percent you can't get much better than that so what this means uh, the FAO eye shark program is probably not quite ready to be taken into the field yet given that only 30 percent of the species are actually correct now it's interesting it's, it's probably not a matter of this program not being functional or um, being capable, but the, um, the machine learning algorithms that it's based on are only as good as the um, data that you put into it. So we're going, we're going to have another go at it and we're going to try and incorporate data that we've collected specific from the fishery uh, into, this, into this program, which will hopefully improve the results that, or improve the 30%. Um, results that we've got from that because it's such a um, it's such a tool it's such a good tool that, that people in enforcement can take it down to the field they can input a photo and they can tell immediately whether it's a protected species or whether it's a species of concern so there is a lot of uh, a lot of things going for them the results from the morphometric ID method are promising 70 percent however the results from the expert visual ID method are, are excellent um, and just goes to show that, that um, machines aren't quite ready to replace people at this point. It also goes to show that, that there is real value in having appropriately trained expertise in, in this area uh, to assist, um, assist staff out in the field in, in making their IDs and also to validate um, these other techniques before they're taken into the field. So, just in conclusion, we, we took this method of using the fins to determine, um, determine the catch in this fishery out into the field and we were able to successfully do that and in fact quite a lot of information about the harvest of this fishery can be gleaned just from being able to access the fins. One of the advantages of doing this is you, you don't have to be on board when the sharks landed, you can actually intercept, if you can intercept the fins at some point, you can get clean quite a bit of information just from having that access and determining the species. And the, the method that we've used is, is applicable far more widely than just um, at the MAU box fishery and in fact can be, be probably successfully used in, in a lot of fisheries where there's a lack of information at the moment to determine species comp composition and also species um, catch quantities. So just in just acknowledgement, I'd like to acknowledge APA for their support of this project, in particular Will Hanson who came out and enjoyed three weeks with me out on the fire and also Jim Crescott whose vision was to um, get this project up and going. The Australian Border Force crew and skipper of the vessel fire who took us out there and um, transported us from boat to boat. Uh, the Northern Territory Department of Primary Industry and Fisheries for um, allowing me to pursue this project. Uh, my co-authors, Lindsay Marshall and Jenny Giles, uh, who can't be here today. And also the Indonesian fishers who um, somewhat, probably somewhat bemused, allowed us to, uh, to sort through their catch and take a small genetic sample. Um, we have prepared a report uh, that will be available in the near future. Um, if anyone would like a copy of that report, uh, please just uh, contact me and as soon as it's available, I will uh, ensure that you get a copy.